We're at home live at EXT with the one and only George Thorogood. George, great to have you on. It's uh, great to talk to you. How you been? Uh, I've been okay. You know, just trying to uh, keep the weight down, keep the chops up, and uh, you know, keep myself occupied and keep my nose to the TV, get the latest on the pandemic. You know, I'm confined to Thorogood headquarters, but I'm used to solitary confinement, Dave. <laughs> you know, you know, you know, let Thorogood roam the streets too much. You know, yeah. It's too much trouble he could get into. So <laughs> this is not new to me. So lockdown was good for you in 2020. What What did you do last year? How did you spend your days? Um, just minding my own business, really. Um, I had to put my uh, my routine as uh, as an international sex symbol on hold. I had to do that. You know, that was uh, <laughs> that was kind of tough. You know. Uh, I had to make, make an alteration there. Uh, <laughs> but uh, no, I, I spent, it's just like what I'm doing now, you know, keeping in touch with people like you. We did some work la- last year, though. We were in uh, America and New Zealand and Australia for a while mm-hmm. before all this hit. Mm-hmm. So we were active right up to then and everything we had scheduled um, had to get postponed. And mm-hmm. Everything's going to stay postponed until we get this thing straightened out. Yeah, hopefully very soon, too. Well, since 1973, George Thorogood and the Destroyers have sold over 15 million albums. 15 million, George! You built the classic catalog of hits, played more than 8,000 ferocious live shows. You've been playing music since you were 17, huh? 15 million, huh? Boy, i got to write that down. Check my, uh, make a phone call. <laughs> Could be more by now. Right away. Hey, you spilled the beans, Dave. <laughs> 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 yeah, but I was about, uh, about 17, 16, 17 when I decided I knew this was, uh, was my calling, whatever you wanted, you know, that I was going to do. Um, took me a while to put it in gear, you know, a couple of years out of high school that my parents probably shook me out of a hangover and kicked me out of the house and say, listen, kid, go for it. <laughs> they're not going to, they're not going to come knocking on the door and say, Hey man, you, you the Rolling Stones want you to play with rockers with them. It's not going to work that way. So, so what, what drew you to that guitar? Uh, you know, it's a funny thing. I had a guitar in the house, and I barely touched it. I fooled around with it, and you know, one day I was I was I started getting into blues. I was very heavy into John Lee Hooker, and uh, I was at a house, and I was playing the guitar. And my neighborhood, in my, my where we live, we had lots of really good guitar players. I mean, lead guitar players, outstanding. So I didn't even think about touching it. But I was fooling around with this, uh, like a John Lee Hooker thing, and I was alone as always. And a friend of mine is a really good guitar player came up, uh, was in the back room making out with his girlfriend, I think. And he came, Mark ran in the room. He was almost very angry. And he said, no, don't tell me you can't play. You don't have any, I've heard you play. We all sat in the next room listening to you play what you were just doing. We thought it was a record. We thought it was a John Lee Hooker record. Wow. And I was like, really? And it was something I was just making up on the, at the time. And he said, no, you, 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 you've got it. And I said, so then after that, I went for it. Nice. Well, you started out as a solo acoustic performer, but soon formed the Delaware Destroyers. But that acoustic setup, I'm going to jump around here for a moment. The acoustic setup isn't something you'd revisit again until just more recently on your acclaimed 2017 album, Party of One, which, by the way, George, is fantastic. One of my favorites of 2017, and still to this day, it's a fantastic album of yours. What was the impetus for making that record? What did you set out to accomplish, and do you feel you accomplished all those things? It was long overdue, uh, Dave. I started out that way, and originally I wanted to do that first, uh, you know, a solo record uh, and, and get that out of the way and then move on to, uh, to the rock scene. Um, but it never quite, you know, evolved to that. We kept, you know, Rounder and I, we kept putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. And I drifted away from their label, and then they, the record they are, the force to be tracked with they are today, which is very successful. Um, and, you know, we, we got together again and said, you know, you never did get around to that solo record, and you've never done one yet. And we had enough requests for it. So I said, okay, but I don't know where my chops are because, you know, I've been playing Bad of the Bone and Who Do You Love for so long. I don't think, I don't know if I could play anything else. So it took a while to do it, but we finally got it done. Rounder put it out. And if it had to happen, I might have never had been able to talk to Dave. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. It's so good. I'm so happy to be talking to the one and only George Thorogood on the phone. Uh, you and your drummer, Jeff Simon, you've been pals since you were 11 years old, and uh, you teamed up with bassist Bill Blau in those early days. How long after you got together do you realize, hey, we've got something together here? We knew it immediately. Prior to that, um, before Jeff and I started working on a band, remember something. I was working as a soloist and not doing half bad at it. Mm. Um, I had people like Sonny Terry, Brandy McGee, uh, Hound Dog Taylor, Robert Lockwood, um, among others, and people 
who, you know, audience people who I played for, um, all were coming to me and I was getting really good favorable reaction and, and enthusiasm from uh, great acoustic blues people, Sonny mm. Terry and whatnot. So I was very encouraged to say, and it was Robert Lockwood said, if you get yourself a guitar, electric guitar and a bass player and a drummer, that's going to take you where you want to go. You can only go so far with what you're doing, but mm. great encouragement. And Jeff, Jeff knew that he was a little bit behind me as far as, um, you know, playing music. He, he wasn't playing music on a regular basis then. And so when we got together, the first gig we did was very good. We had a fantastic reaction. And that night I said, Hey, listen, you and me got to get together tomorrow and talk. And we did. And we, we saw something coming right away. And, uh, you usually know something like that. Um, it's, it, it, it doesn't have to bang you right on the head. When you, when you go into the second song and the entire dance floor is, is packed and the club owner says, what are you doing tomorrow? I want to hire you. I mean, that's, that's, that's a telltale sign. You're on the right road. You know it. Yeah. Well, that debut record comes out in 77. It goes gold and includes a medley of John Lee Hooker's house rent boogie and one bourbon, one scotch, one beer. 78 and Move It On Over comes out. That goes gold and includes that Hank Williams tune. Also includes Who Do You Love, The Sky Is Crying, Cocaine Blues. All killer, no filler. You guys are on top of the world by now, aren't you? I wouldn't say exactly on top of the world, but we were we were slowly moving into achieving what we wanted to do. Mm. I remember after that first record came out, we had a talk with uh, Powers to Get Rounder, who were pretty much not not prepared for this. They were they were small label, and you know their their distribution was conservative, to say the least. And when we did the first record, we had offers to do other things. We said, let's stay with Rounder because there's something really bothered me then, Dave. Because when I first started out, everybody was saying, you can't get anywhere without originals. You got to have originals. You can't have originals. Mm. And you got to be with a major label. So I looked at Marion Layton, who was the president of the company. I said, look, let's make a record. I'll bet I can make a record with no originals on it with no major distribution. If the music is good enough, the record will carry itself. I'm going to make my point. So the record went gold and I said, see, no originals. They're all really good songs. <laughs> people don't really care. I mean, when people are out on a dance floor and they're rocking out, they don't really care who wrote the song. Right. They just care who, if they dig it. Yep. Did Johnny Cash write a boy named Sue? No, it's a monster hit. So right. that's that's the bottom line right there. So we proved our point at that time. Mm. Um, so no one can ever take that away from us, Rounder and myself included. Mm. I got to say, by 1981, you guys were a well-oiled machine. You released four albums at that point on the verge of releasing 82's Bad to the Bone, perhaps your finest record, certainly cementing your place in rock history. In concert, you were playing tunes from that yet-to-be-released monster record. Rolling Stones' sideman Ian Stewart plays keyboards on that album. You toured with the Rolling Stones and appeared on SNL. That year, 82, that or 81, that must have been a roller coaster of a ride. Well, it sure was, but it was... Uh... It was a roller coaster ride, Dave, that I had, been, I had been standing in line with a ticket for 15 years. Yeah. <laughs> waiting to get on that roller coaster, which I thought was my, my birthright to be there. And I worked hard to get to that spot. So it wasn't just like something just happened out of nowhere. It was, it was definitely planned. Sure. Uh, we played some shows with the stuff. We definitely toured with Ian Stewart. He toured with us in the States. He toured with us in Canada. And, that was really something special. After all, he was the original founding member of the Rolling Stones. Right, right. How did you handle all that fame and success? Hey, no problem, Dave. I have a massive ego. <laughs> I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> well, you recorded a couple of classic tunes acoustically for us. We're going to talk about this uh, brand new live album out in just a few moments. But uh, tell us about these songs you did acoustically for us. First one I'm going to play for you, and for everybody, is this uh, Bo Diddley song, Ride on Josephine. It was included originally on your self-titled debut album. Why is it so special to you? It was um, a, a Bo Diddley thing that I did some research on. Those first two records, yours truly did a lot of research through, through album after album after album. This is before everything was exposed. Um, it was a lot of obscure material, and I was really, you know, the well was almost dry as opposed to great material that had been exposed by the Rolling Stones and John Hammond, uh, people like that. And I wanted to, to follow in, in that tradition. So I, I found this song right on Josephine and then the original version. So we decided we'd make a, a very, um, 
standard Bo Diddley type arrangement around it. And as a result, um, it's it's one of our fan favorites. What can I say? Let's take a listen to it. George Thorogood, right on Josephine Live at EXT. Right on Josephine, right on. Right on Josephine, right on. Right on Josephine, you know you got a running machine. Right on Josephine, baby, right on. Well, Josephine driving a hot rod Ford. Twin carburetor's gonna eat up the road. Twin exhaust sticking out of the rear. Something that'll really take away from here. Right on, Josephine, right on. Right on, Josephine, right on. Right on, Josephine, girl, you got a running machine. Right on, Josephine, baby, right on. Well, Josephine's engine said it started to run hot. Try to trade it in at a used car lot. The band couldn't believe his unnatural eyes when he pulled it up into his drive. Right on, Josephine, right on. Right on, Josephine, right on. Right on, Josephine, you know you got a running machine. Right on, Josephine, baby, right on. Josephine, your tank is leaking, boo. I think you better slow down, ride with me. You say what? Yes, me, what kind of car am I driving? I tell you. I got a 69 Cadillac with Thunderbird wings. Telling you, baby, it's a bad old thing. I can burn rubber in each and every gear. I think I can rock and roll right out of here. Right on, Josephine, right on. Right on, Josephine, right on. Right on, Josephine, you know you got a running machine. Right on, Josephine, baby, right on. I come in last night about a half past ten The baby of mine wouldn't let me in Moving on over Rocking on over Move over little dog Cause I mean old dog moving in Listen to me dog before you start to whine That side yours and this side mine So moving on over Rocking on over Move over little dog Cause I mean old dog moving in Warned me once, she warned me twice I don't take nobody's advice Move it on over Rock it on over Move over little dog Cause I mean old dog moving in Take it! Chained a lock on my back door And now my key don't fit no more Move it on over Rock it on over Move over little dog Cause I mean old dog moving in Move it on over Move it on over Move it on over Rock it on over Move over cool dog Cause a hot dog's moving in Suitable for framing? Mm -hmm. All right. We're at home live at EXT with the one and only George Thorogood. And there's Hank Williams moving on over the title and lead track off of that second album from 1978. That album, 38 Minutes of Killer Boogie Blues. Did you befriend some of these guys like uh, Bo Diddley and uh, Willie Dixon and folks like that? I know uh, Hank Williams had, had passed long before, but... Uh, were you friends with these guys? And, and, and what was their take on your takes of their songs? 
Bo Diddley and I, and I and I were close. Not the easiest man to get close to, but we were close. Um, John Lee and, and Hooker and I were very good friends. Uh, we spent an awful lot of time together, um, pretty much right up till the till the time of his death. Rest in peace. Um, but we were we were we were close. Our, you know, the, those two artists uh, more than anybody are. You know, our, our, our styles are very close. So they're very, very one chord oriented, uh, one chord with a, with a lot of passion and a lot mm-hmm. of drive behind it. But our, um, and John Lee Hooker was an unbelievable baseball freak. I mean, the guy, the guy just never stopped talking baseball, <laughs> even in the middle of winter. <laughs> he was, he was a real gem. Wilmington, Delaware native, but Boston, George, holds a very special place in your heart. Tell us about that. It's like a chain reaction thing that happened to me when I was playing and uh, someone heard me and sent me to New York to do a guest set with Bonnie Raitt and Little Feed. When I was doing that, I ran into Bonnie Raitt's manager, Dick Waterman, who sent me up to Boston at a club called Joe's Place to do a guest set with Sonny Terry and Brandy McGee. Mm. And they hired me on the spot to open for them for the next couple of weeks, which is unbelievable. Two weeks ago, I'm playing on a street corner in San Francisco, <laughs> and here I am getting paid with Sonny Terry and Brandy McGee. Wow. Okay? <laughs> Crazy. So... <laughs> It kind of rolled from there, and the action was in the New England area for blues, and of course that's where we ran into Rounder. So uh, that that kind of was um, our cornerstone of our um, our beginning. Wow, November twenty third, nineteen eighty two. You remember that date? Well, we did three <laughs> dates at that venue, Dave. Um, three times at the at the Bradford. Um, yeah, Boston's Bradford Ballroom, now the Royal Nightclub. But, uh, yeah, yeah, it was a it was a hotel at one time, the Bradford Hotel. Hmm. Um, I was really impressed because we not only did it more than once. Um, it was right in the heart of the combat zone, which is in Boston, which are, at that time was a very dangerous area. Uh, that's why they called it the combat zone. I think the police called it the combat zone. And to get that kind of fan turnout in in that area, to come to that area was a not just a tribute to us, but a tribute to rock fans in general. I mean. Let's face it, rock fans will go anywhere to see the show. I mean, yep. they hitchhike in the rain for three days to see the Grateful Dead. Sure. I mean, you know, right. I mean, that's that's the lore. I mean, they they, they don't care. They'll, they'll, you know, they'll run up a rat's ass if they get a chance to, to see Led Zeppelin, you know what I mean? Yeah. So yep. that's just the, the rock thing, not just us. But that's what impressed us more than anything. 1982. That show uh, was recorded, now available for everyone to experience. It's called Live in Boston, 1982, the complete concert. It includes 12 unreleased tracks, 27 songs in all, including the hits, Who Do You Love, Bad to the Bone, four LPs, two CDs on all streaming services. George, do you ever get tired of playing any of those songs? Tired? Yes. Tired of playing them? No. (laughs) Um, (laughs) No, we designed these songs, you know, not just to expose the material, but we, we create our records or whatever we do, find a song, write a song, whatever. They're ninety nine percent fan based. I mean, we're playing them for those people. It's like a like a restaurant that has a menu. Mm. You, you have a menu for your customers, and you keep the customers going by what they they want. So, no, I don't, I don't get tired. That's why that was that was there. Hey, hey, man, you ever hear you you ever heard the applause after we get done? Who do you love? Yeah. Did you talk about George's ego? <laughs> no, I don't get tired of it. No, thank you very much. <laughs> is that your favorite part of being on stage is the audience reaction to you being up there? What is your favorite part of being on stage? Well, let's put it this way. Do you, what do you love more, being on the phone with your lover or being in bed with them? Mm. Okay, so just put it in those terms and there's your answer. I got it. You guys make magic up on that stage. George, did you ever have a plan B? If it wasn't for music, what do you think you'd be doing now? Well, you know, I was, uh, you know, back there and I was thinking, uh, well, hmm. Doesn't look like Paul Newman or James Coburn are going to retire anytime. So (laughs) I better pick up the guitar and give. No, there was no Plan B. Um, Sometimes that works in your uh, in your favor. I had nothing to fall back on. Nothing that I care to fall back on. You know, this was it. Uh, I was uh, I was in in the pocket from day one. I couldn't really play right away. Not not many people can, except for Paul McCartney and Mozart. (laughs) (laughs) But but, yeah, you have to work to get to a spot. But I was in my element from from the moment I started. Do you still play now? Do you still practice the guitar every single day? What's your regimen like? I play the guitar. I don't. I don't. I don't practice. I. Uh, I ran into Randy Newman, and he was doing a seminar for some fourth graders, and he put something into my head and other people's heads that he told that the parents don't tell your children to practice because that's that's like it's saying work. work. Hmm. Just play. 
Willie Mays never practiced baseball. Mm. <laughs> he, he just played. Mm. And then one day he woke up and he was very good at it. Mm. So I said, if I sit down and practice, I go, this is drudgery. So I try to get that out of my head, pick up the guitar and, and, and just play it and, and enjoy the moment. Yeah. Do you have any plans for 2021? Yeah, I got plans. Um, <laughs> I got plans. I got plans to keep breathing, to keep walking, and keep moving. That's, that's, Amen. That's plan number one, and I'm going to stick to it. Yeah, if you can, if we're all able to, are we going to be seeing you out on the road? Well, we have engagements, Dave, um, that were supposed to be done last year, and they got postponed till this year. So, and nothing's been canceled yet. Nothing's been postponed yet. We got a. Uh, we're very fortunate, uh, Dave. We, we we still got a calendar full of. Uh, of engagements and um, you know more offers coming in. It's it's quite flattering. We've been doing this for a hundred years, you know. <laughs> and it's like so you know they they haven't canceled us yet. So we're looking forward to that. So um, I'd, I'd like to I'd like to stay on the phone a little longer. I'm going to run downtown to get my shot. So I'm ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready to see you. <laughs> and that's not a shot of bourbon either. Oh. I love it. George, you've been a part of my whole upbringing, and uh, you were a part of my formative years of, of listening to music, so I appreciate you, and I thank you for your years of service and what you've brought to the music industry and uh, to my life personally. I, I, I want to thank you. You've uh, given me many, many, many hours of enjoyment. GeorgeThorogood.com is the website. Live in Boston, 1982, the complete concert, now available on four LPs, two CDs, on all streaming services. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. It's uh, quite an honor to talk to you. Uh, Dave, uh, a, a real pleasure on this end. We're going to take everybody out with this song, another song you recorded acoustically for us. Tell us about this one, uh, Bo Diddley's Who Do You Love? Well, that was a last-minute thing that the rounder threw at me to put in there, and I... Uh, been a fan of that song it's the whole world has been actually mm. and i uh heard uh many different versions of it and every any rock band in the in the 60s early 70s who who are worth their salt um does a bo diddley song and they, yep. everybody knows how to do who do you love uh, sure. you know and then we were we knew how to do it but we didn't have enough material to cover the record so the president of the company said well why don't you do that and i said well, I'm a company man. I'm not going to argue with the president of the record company. <laughs> so, so it ended up on the record. Love it. Love it. George Thorogood, everybody. George, thank you so much. All the best to you. You take care now, Dave. I walk 47 miles of barbed wire. I got a cobra stick for a Brand new house on the roadside. Made it a rattlesnake hide. Brand new chin that mama built on top, made out of human skull. Come on, take a little walk with me, honey. Tell me who you love. Who you love. Who you love. Arlene took me up by my hand. She said, Lonesome George, you know I understand. Who do you love? Who do you love? And I was dark and the sky was blue Down the aisle where a Cadillac flew Hit a bump and somebody screamed Should have heard just what I seen Who do you love? Who do you love? I walked 47 miles of barbed wire I got a cobra snake for a nip Brand new house on the roadside Made it a rattlesnake hide Brand new chin that's built on top Made out of human skull Come on, take a little walk with me, baby, and tell me who do you love?